So when we joined, it was like a $13 billion company. And in fact, the day we joined, the stock, the, the value of the stock went up by $600 million. And it, it was because, you know, they thought like, so we were a payments company. They thought, okay, things took a drastic turn and, and it went from being a $13 billion company to being a, like a billion dollar company <laughs> over the course of that year, less than a year. Yeah. It's been really interesting story all along the way. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Vacuum. Today on the line, I'm extremely happy to have Shiel from 500 Startups to talk about the industry, uh, about the 500 FinTech fund that he leads. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to be here. Very cool. So maybe one of the first things that I'm very curious about, you've had basically a fairly long running podcast at this point, right? The Pitch. Yeah, we started in July of 2015. And so it might have been June, June or July 2015. We started out doing it every other week. And it's called The Pitch. And then we changed formats a little bit. In, in the beginning of 2017, we got approached by Gimlet Media, a podcasting company, to get acquired by them. So they acquired us in 2017, and then they got acquired by Spotify. So now we're part of Spotify. Wonderful. So are you still part of that, or is that something that you are just sort of overseeing at this point? I'm part of it. I'm no, no longer on every episode. I'm probably on about half of the episodes now. But the, the concept for it was simple. Um, it's based on this show called Shark Tank in the US. Do you, know, do you know Shark Tank? Absolutely. So it's based off Shark Tank. I really enjoyed that show, but thought it was very unrealistic. So I wanted to make my own version that was actually realistic and actually thinking about real startups that, that you, that, you know, are, are the type of startups that we look at at Silicon Valley, not these, you know, on Shark Tank, you have the towel with the hole in it or whatever, and that kind of stuff. Um, so we, the idea was originally, I'll just record people who are pitching me and put it on a podcast. And then it evolved into something actually quite a bit more like Shark Tank, which was we have a panel of judges who make an investing decision on the spot. So what's the biggest thing that you learned from that? I'd say like narrative really matters for these things. And actually like, it's really important for us to edit what we get. And that has made the podcast very compelling. You've done a lot. So looking at your profile, listening to a couple of uh, your talks and that sort of thing, how many companies you personally or you as the company have invested in, is there something that drives your decision making when, when you're doing that, when you decide like, this is something that's worth putting money into. I'm a seed stage investor. So I invest the earliest stages of a company when there's not much there, there may not be, it may be an idea and one person sometimes or two people. So more than anything else, I'm investing in a team and I am you know, judging whether that team can execute on their vision. And really it's, can they set their vision and clearly define it to me? And then, you know, how well do I think they'll be able to execute on it? And it's really, it's really a lot about setting and defining that vision. Because if you, if you are able to clearly articulate that vision to me, you probably will be able to clearly articulate it to, you know, other investors in the future, future employees, and future customers. So I think that's, that's the most important thing I look for. And then I'd say, like, we break it down into what I call the four or five T's. So team being, you know, the most important one. Then there's technology. So, like, what is the technology advantage that allows this company to exist right now? We don't invest in non-technology companies. So like, is there something, 
inherent about the technology that makes that allows it to this company to exist right now. So team technology traction, um, you know, what have they done? How far have they gotten? And traction does not necessarily have to be a revenue number. It could be a, a it could be like they've gotten past some hurdle from a regulatory perspective, for example. So there's many different types of traction. And, you know, I invest primarily in fintech. So there, oftentimes, the companies are not live. There's no revenue to speak of. So it's traction, team, technology. Another one is total addressable market. So it's kind of a cheat because, you know, it's, uh, it's, the T is t- total, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but but how big is the market opportunity for this product? So like if you're building a company that aspires to, I don't know, be a neobank in Latvia and that's your aspiration, you know, that's probably not a big enough market for me. So it's really like, is there is there an opportunity to build a billion dollar company? And really the way I think about it is like, can you get to $100 million in revenue? And sort of alongside that, like the scale aspect, I also think back to the team and think, is this the leader that's going to get me there? And I think I only want to invest in leaders that will get me there. Um, so so those, are, those are many of them. And then there's probably some other T's around terms. So like, is the valuation on the company fair, for example? But broadly speaking, I think we invest in, we like to invest in very sharp teams with building a great product in a big market. So how do you know that a team is, is right for the job? I like teams where I learn from the founders. So people who have profound knowledge and experience, yeah, ideally in the industry that they're trying to disrupt, that can be good. doesn't always have to be the case, but that, that can be good. Again, it's like setting that vision and describing that vision, articulating it to me. And then we sort of look at team comp, and this is all talking about the CEO, but really then there's team composition. And and the team composition, we look for sort of that hacker, hustler, hipster can be a good combo. So hustler is the business guy, like doing all the business development deals, all that kind of stuff. Hacker is the CTO, you know, building the product. And then hipster is a designer who's you know able to meet with customer, do the customer development, and decide what to build and how to design it and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the prototypical combo of, of, of folks we look for. Which it doesn't always the, have to be that way. Which one of them would be you if you were a founder, or if I am the hustler? Founder? You're the hustler. Yeah, for sure. Mainly because I don't have any skills in any of the other things, so by default I have to be the hustler. So. Looking at your sort of portfolio, there's obviously things that you invested as a fund, but you're also joining boards sometimes. There's Starship, which is like a mobile health savings account. You have yep. Quill for like individual contractors, freelancers, and giving them the tools that they need. Or Bloom Credit, which is the improving their financial eligibility. So what makes you not only invest, but actually jump on the board as well? Yeah, sure. So at the seed stage, not all companies have boards in the US. I would say most seed stage companies do not have boards. So I don't always need to be on the board. In fact, sometimes I like to think of boards as boards, B-O-R-E-D-S, B-O-R-E-D-S, because yeah. they're just boring. It's boring because I'm talking to the founders every week. So having a three-hour board meeting once a quarter is kind of some sometimes I think of it as almost irrelevant, but it really depends founder to founder. And for some founders, it makes a lot of sense because it allows you to step back and look at the business from a bird's eye view and like really decide whether this is what you want to be doing or are there steps we can take, differences, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm I like I like boards in some cases and in some cases I don't think they make sense. Um so uh, I just join the boards based on whether the founders ask me to or not. There's this really cool slide that you used in one of your presentations that I saw online, which basically said that 
you know, here's the, here's the website of Wells Fargo, I think it was. And I was like, here's yeah. 600 different startups that are now trying to get, uh, get their business. Where do you think this is now all going? Is it, are we going to see more Wells Fargo's of the world? Or are we going to see like 600 Wells Fargo's divided into small pieces? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. So in the U.S., there are like 5,000 banks. Yeah. And there are four really big ones. Citigroup, JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. And those four have continued to grow over time, and really the top 10 have. And then there's like these other smaller banks, and these smaller banks are having trouble competing because what used to be interesting was like banking, what used to make a bank was just being in your community. And it was a, you'd go to the bank branch in your community, they'd know you, all this sort of stuff. Now things have changed with technology. But so like there's these large banks and these small banks and these small banks, I think really need to partner with startups, you know, different startup just for lending, a different startup for investing, different startup for advice, different startup for insurance. And now all of these apps are adding in the features of the others and they end up all competing for the same customer set, which is challenging. So far, these startups are able to acquire customers relatively cheaply and, you know, all of the many of these startups are becoming neobanks. Yeah, there was a there was an interview with Tom Blomfield of uh, Monzo recently, and he yeah. said this really sort of I don't know whether it was a positive ending to the documentary or a negative ending, but he basically said, well, you know, a couple of years from now we're basically going to be the incumbents, and then you know the matrix can start all over again yeah. or something. <laughs> That's exactly right. It happens. It happens all the time, and some of the earlier stage fintech companies are basically the incumbents now. Yeah. Square, Stripe, etc. Yeah, absolutely. They they don't operate like incumbents. Like they they're relatively lean and nimble. I love your term BWS, like the yeah. analogy to AWS. So, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and what it actually means for the future? Sure. So BWS is banking web services, named after AWS, of course, Amazon Web Services. Yeah, and. Amazon Web Services really was a step change for startups because it made it much cheaper to get started. You didn't need to buy your own servers and all this other stuff that you, you, you would have, have to, had to do before. You could just, you know, spin like buy buy some storage compute time on on AWS, and and you could start a startup very easily. And with banking, right now it's been really complicated like there's they don't really give out regulatory licenses so the way to become a bank is to partner with another bank but there are all these headaches involved in partnering so a bws banking web services is a technology company that integrates in with the bank and also integrates in like kyc fraud credit all these other things that you need and creates that uh that that company that that shell that you can use if you want to integrate banking services in. So are you seeing that happening in the US? We have a couple in Europe, sort of Solaris Bank, there are Thorell's Bank, yeah. Starlink to some extent. What are you seeing in the US? Yeah, so Solaris and Rails Bank are exactly the right the right ones to think about in Europe. In the US, there's a company called called uh wow, the name is escaping Synapse. Synapse, uh, Synapse FI is probably the furthest along. There's another company called Unit Finance, and there's another one called Bond. These are all companies sort of broadly in the same space, and they all have slightly different angles, but, but broadly very similar. Technology companies that allow you to integrate with them rather than with a bank. And the way I think about it is Stripe allowed you to integrate with Stripe rather than going into the bank itself. Like you used to have to go to the bank, get a merchant account, get a payment gateway, and Stripe made it easy, you just go to Stripe directly. And that's what Unit and these other companies are doing as well. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because you call it BWS, some people call it invisible banking, some people call it embedded finance or embedded banking, but it's let's make banking and payments almost like a telco, make it and a utility like electricity or gas or water, and let's just enable players to start whatever products on top of it. Completely, completely. 
And what's interesting is there'll be all these non fintech companies that will be able to be fintech companies through comp through BWS. So if you're a Shopify or a let's say you're a soft, there's a software company here called MindBody that just builds software for yoga studios. Yeah. Well, you know, there's probably an opportunity to become for that company to do to provide banking services if it was really easy you know you're already accepting payments why not do other layers of the stack it, it may make sense to do that and you could do that through a company like unit have you invested in any of these sorts of more infrastructure or helping out the existing players succeed as opposed to launching completely new products i haven't done a whole lot in that space and I would like to, frankly. I have a lot to learn. It really stems from me not being able to easily assess. You know, I invest at the seed stage and you just don't have a lot of data. I don't yeah. really understand what banks need. So it's hard for me to assess at the seed stage, like, does it make sense to make that investment? At later stages, it's easier because like you have proof points from the banks. Like they've already sold something to the bank and you have revenue, you have traction, you can talk to the bank. At seed, it's like they have an idea for something that they think the banks want, but I don't know if the banks actually want it. So that, that's been the challenge. So changing gears slightly, you were part of Groupon after you got acquired. That's right, yeah. So how, what was that experience like? So joining Groupon in 2012, this was not necessarily the peak, but it was definitely a time when Groupon was still growing and, and, and the big player in the industry, wasn't it? Yeah, it actually, and in fact, it actually was about the peak. So at that time, so when we joined the beginning of 2012, it was like a 13, 12, 13 billion dollar company. And in fact, the day we joined the stock, the, the value of the stock went up by $600 million. And it, it was because, you know, they thought like, so we were a payments company. They thought, okay, well, these guys are building, these guys are building something in the payment space. They're expanding categories. So that, that was quite interesting things took a drastic turn and, and it went from being a $13 billion company to being a, like a billion dollar company <laughs> over the course of that year, less than a year. So a massive, massive drop. And then, you know, and then it went back and, you know, again was a three or $4 billion company. And then now it's back down and COVID has really completely made it, crap it's now like a 500 million dollar company yeah. it's been really interesting story all along the way so what do you think caused that was it overhype in the beginning or was it something that changed in the industry over time yeah it was overhype in the beginning um when they started 2009 10 they you know the u.s economy was not doing very well so people were looking for ways to save money. And then also merchants were, were hurting. So merchants were looking to get people into the restaurants, into the spas, all this sort of stuff. So they, they came at it at the right time. But then the product that they offered, it was really a flawed business model because it wasn't profitable for the merchant. And the merchant originally, Groupon tried to sell it as if it was a marketing avenue for the merchant. So do one of these deals, you'll get customers that keep coming back, et cetera. You know, what is the lifetime value of your customer? Well, what if we can get you more of those customers was the idea. But then actually the lifetime value of a Groupon customer is very different. It's very discount driven and they would come in, do the Groupon and then never come back. And so then the restaurants were losing money and like you couldn't compare it to a marketing expense because the customer was never coming back. And that was really the big problem in the downfall. And they were never really able to recover and never able to really create an interesting product. I think there could have been something there. Like, I think the real problem to solve is why do you spend, why does it cost the same amount of money to eat on a Wednesday at 4 p.m. On a, in January versus 7 p.m. New Year's Eve? You know, that I think is a problem that you could solve. The same thing for a gym. You know, a gym class costs the same on a Wednesday at 11 a.m. versus at 8 a.m. that morning when people, you know, want to go. 
So I think there, there was some element of trying to solve that, but they never really got there. And now, you know, now I don't know if it's going to survive. I mean, there's going to be massive impacts. I, I think the services industry, the restaurants and that kind of stuff is just closed for the foreseeable future here. And the trickle down, the ripple effects of that are massive. And then, so that those, that's, I guess, short term. Then there's more longer term impacts, which are, you know, how does this, does this change where people want to live? Does it change where people want to work? And I think those things are definitely real and, and possible. I've got a friend with, I've got some friends with restaurants in, in San Francisco and maybe, you know, they have, they have sit down restaurants where you dine in and get served. But I think it makes more sense to have fast casual where people can come in, leave, take the food, do delivery, all that kind of stuff. Might be more of the future in the coming months, years. So they're thinking about shifting entirely to, to, to something like that. So one of, your, one of your sort of very early in your career was working with Kiwa. Um, yeah. So is there something that sort of at the time you learned that I think we could apply to this new sort of crisis? Yeah, so so for those of you who don't know, Kiva is a website, kiva.org, K-I-V-A.org, website where people primarily in the developed world can make loans to individuals in the developing world for the sake of alleviating poverty, all 0% interest loans. And what that does, what these loans do is really allow people to smooth consumption. So like, rather than you know, you get the harvest and then you have the money and you spend it, you know, you can sort of spend it over time, get a loan for when you need it, or even get a loan for an irrigation pump that increases the harvest, for example. And it, uh, microfinance does work for, for a good portion of the population. It doesn't work for the poorest of the poor. It's not a silver bullet, but for people who have some money, who have some income, you know, these loans are, are able to be helpful. Now your question around can loans help with coronavirus? Absolutely. Like lending money to people who need it now can help them get on their feet and get back to work, back to business, especially loans to small businesses. So I'm I'm all in favor of it. You know, to the extent that the government provides grants to these folks, that's wonderful. But if not, I think loans are a great way to get folks back in business. So when you got started in the industry and in, in, in fintech specifically or me investing in fintech, is there something that you wish you would have known in the beginning? I think something I knew, but it has been reinforced time and time again is it, originally we thought that fintechs were replacing the banks, but really fintechs need to partner with the banks and fintechs on the banking side you need to partner with banks and it just always takes longer than you'd expect to get that partnership done it's never as straightforward as it seems and no matter what the startup tells you like oh we have a we're already done like there's already integration we're going to launch next month no it's going to be six months from now <laughs> so there's all sorts of all sorts of those challenges thank you for the opportunity to talk to you yeah absolutely i think i think it was a Great conversation. For those who want to reach you, for those that have cool ideas, for people that want to know more about what you're doing and how to follow you, where can they reach you? And find more? Yeah, I think Twitter is probably the best way. My Twitter name is Pit Desi, P-I-T-D-E-S-I, and you can DM me there or whatever. Oh, wonderful. I'll put that in the, in the notes so people can easily uh, click on it and get there. Thank you once again for your time. Have a wonderful day uh, today and all the best in these crazy corona times. Yeah, absolutely. Same to you. Cheers. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.